One of the things that I am constantly concerned about, more often than I would like to admit, is using the internet. I obviously have to as this is my job, but I have always worried that my safety and personal information was simply a luck of the draw that nothing has happened to it. You hear on the news constantly of people's information getting stolen or completely leaked, and that is a true fear of happening to me. Having my personal information out there, and then anyone with a mouse and keyboard having basically limitless options on what they wanted to do with it. It's why I actually started using a VPN that I knew I could trust, and that VPN service is PIA, or Private Internet Access. What I love about it is the amount of transparency PIA offers. From never recording or storing my data, changing my IP address, and not only rerouting but also encrypting it, to allowing me to customize how I want my VPN to operate. I know many out there may not see the use of VPNs or only see them as tools to stream Netflix from other countries, but the true protection they offer means much more than simply streaming content. It allows me to feel secure with 100% anonymity online while simultaneously blocking ads, trackers, and malware. The ease of it as well is a big standout for me, as I can add PIA to 10 different devices with just one subscription. Having it accessible on Windows, Mac, Android, Linux, and more help me know that even if I ever change my devices, I can still get the same protection. PIA has more than 30 million downloads, and signing up for private internet access is risk-free. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee, plus their highly skilled customer support team of experts is available 24-7. If you are without a VPN, I strongly recommend recommend you click my link in the description box below to get Pia for less than $3 a month and an extra two months completely free. So start browsing with confidence and peace of mind today by using my link in the description. Now on to the video. On August 16, 1942, just after 6 a.m., an L-8 blimp designated Flight 101 would take off from Treasure Island in California on a then routine scouting trip to monitor the Pacific Ocean for potential Japanese submarines that at that point had been conducting secret attacks along the western coastline of the United States. Flight 101 would be piloted by 27-year-old Lieutenant Ernest Cody and 32-year-old Charles Adams. As the two pilots were making progress on their intended flight path, communication was lost a little after two hours after their takeoff. Three hours later, with no word from the pilots, squadron headquarters was made aware that a blimp had landed in the middle of the street in Daly City, California. Nobody was injured in the crash landing, but the two pilots had seemingly vanished. Nearly eight decades later, the whereabouts of the two men still remain unknown. This is the true story of Flight 101, or what has gone on to be known as the Ghost Blimp. Before jumping into the events of August 16th, 1942, I need to go back a few months to February 24th and 25th of the same year. America at the time was still reeling from the recent attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. That ultimately led to their involvement in World War II. Tensions were still very high in the following months, and with confirmed Japanese submarine sightings off the coast of California, not only the state, but the entire country was holding their breath, as many assumed an attack or full-out invasion on the west coast would soon occur. It didn't help that from December of 1941 to February of 1942, 14 American ships were attacked by Japanese subs, resulting in seven of them sinking. Following the attacks on February 23, 1942, a Japanese I-17 submarine surfaced near Santa Barbara, California and attacked the Elwood oil field. While there were no casualties and the property damage was minimal, many Americans saw this as not so much a full-scale attack. The world, after all, had witnessed what Japan was capable of at Pearl Harbor. Instead, many saw this as psychological warfare, constantly keeping the country alert and making them panic and wonder when the next attack would occur. 
This now leads us to February 24th and 25th, when the skies of Los Angeles would ignite in gunfire and searchlights as many thought they had seen Japanese fighter pilots or bombers approaching the city for an attack. Given the growing stress levels, this alleged sighting is what caused the panic to boil over. Throughout the night, the military fired over 1,400 artillery shells, many firing sporadically as most on the ground didn't know what they were shooting at. It was also reported that civilians emerged from their homes and started shooting at the sky with rifles and pistols. As the dust finally settled and the sun rose over the city, many expected to see the area littered with crash planes and wrecked buildings. Instead, when people emerged from their homes, they saw none of that. It came to be known that it was in fact a false alarm and no enemy planes were ever over Los Angeles. The military attributed the battle to war nerves, and it went down in history to be known as the Battle of Los Angeles. Some of you may have heard of this story before, and while I won't go into full details of it in this video, it is actually still debated to this day on if the military was using the battle as a cover-up, and some argue that it was in fact an enemy plane, while others say it was of course, aliens. But I had to tell you that to give you some kind of context on why two pilots were using a blimp to scout the California coast in the first place. The tensions that were created from both Pearl Harbor and the Battle of Los Angeles were still very much being felt in August of 1942. Since the submarine attacks from months earlier were still a threat, scouting by both air and sea were a very common thing at this time. And on August 16th, 1942, it was just another day for pilots Ernest Cody and Charles Adams as they got into their L-8 blimp that was fitted with two 325-pound depth charges and a 30 caliber machine gun with 300 rounds of ammunition. Their mission, as it was nothing new to them, was to search for any Japanese submarines and sink them. The flight was scheduled to travel to the Farallon Islands, 30 miles west of San Francisco, then head north to Point Reyes and then south to Montero Beach before making their return trip back to Treasure Island. Overall, the patrol would take around four hours and the crew were expected to return back to base by 10.30 in the morning. The L-8 departed from the base at 6.03 a.m. As the blimp silently made its way to the first destination, all seemed in order. Cody and Adams made their way over the Golden Gate Bridge and continued to head southwest towards the Farallon Islands. At 7.38 a.m., an hour and a half into their patrol, Cody radioed in and reported their location as four miles east of the Farallon Islands. Four minutes later, at 7.42 a.m., Cody again radioed in, reporting in on an oil spill that they spotted, potentially from a submarine. Dropping several flares, the L-8 proceeded to circle the area investigating for any possible submarine. No bombs were dropped, however. There was a nearby fishing ship at the time called the Daisy Gray that was so close to the blimp that the first mate of the ship was able to actually see both Cody and Adams in the blimp with his binoculars. Nothing seemed out of place and the two pilots were said to have appeared normal and not in a frantic state. A second ship was also in the area and spotted the flares. The Liberty ship, the Gallatin, sounded off their alarm and had soldiers man the guns in case a submarine were to surface. After an hour of investigating, the L-8 began to ascend back into the sky shortly after 9am and continued making its way to Point Reyes. This would be the last reported sighting of both Cody and Adams. At 8.20 a.m., radio control attempted contacting the L-8, but there was no response. Another attempt to make radio contact was made again at 8.50 a.m. What was odd was that at the time of both attempted radio contacts, the L-8 was investigating the oil spill, and both Cody and Adams had been physically seen by one of the fishermen. So for them not to return radio contact is odd. It could have been that their radio was malfunctioning or perhaps they were too focused on their investigation. When radio control hadn't heard from the pilots by 9 a.m., the same time the L-8 was ascending to end their investigation, Radio Command sent out two planes to attempt to locate them. 
The next reported sighting of the blimp was at 10.49 a.m. when a pilot reported seeing the blimp over the Golden Gate Bridge. The pilot also reported that everything seemed fine. While he didn't physically see Cody or Adams, the pilot assumed that everything was fine. Nothing appeared to be malfunctioning with the blimp and it was assumed that the two men were making their way back to Treasure Island. At 11 a.m., one of the pilots sent out to search for the L-8 spotted it around three miles west of Salada Beach. The thing that stood out to the pilot was that the blimp was near 2,000 feet in the air, which isn't common to have that much altitude due to it being very close to the blimp's overall pressure height. The next sighting was made by another pilot who reported the blimp to be near Mile Rock and also assumed that it was simply heading back to base. A few minutes later, an off-duty seaman saw the blimp and noticed that it was actually bent in the middle. He ended up photographing the blimp and watched it as it continued making its way to San Francisco. At 11.15 a.m., the blimp approached the shoreline of Ocean Beach in San Francisco. Its altitude had dropped tremendously, being reported to only be around 50 feet above the water. As the blimp approached the shore, it touched down briefly. Two fishermen actually ran to the blimp and attempted to hold it down by their tie lines. The impact the blimp made when hitting the shore bent the propellers and filled much of the engine with dirt. The fishermen attempting to hold it down quickly lost their grip as the blimp's weight was far too great for them to hold. As the blimp continued skipping along the ground, one of the two depth charges was knocked loose and fell off, freeing the blimp of over 300 pounds and allowing it to gain more altitude. It continued on in the direction of nearby Daly City. As the blimp arrived in the city, police and firefighters were closely following behind, along with many residents of the area, in both shock and awe that this was happening in front of their eyes. The L-8 brushed along the rooftops of several houses and at exactly 11.30 a.m., the blimp finally landed on Bellevue Avenue. Police rushed to the wreckage and frantically looked for the pilots they assumed to be injured. Firefighters sliced open the envelope of the blimp, yet when the inside of the gondola was searched, they found the door to be open and the cabin empty. The two pilots had seemingly vanished. The crowd that gathered around the now wrecked blimp were increasing in size every minute. It seemed that everyone in the city who witnessed the L-8 coming down came to investigate. Not long after the wreck occurred, the military showed up expecting to find both Cody and Adams. When they discovered that both men were in fact missing, a search was immediately started. While some stayed examining the inside of the L-8, the Coast Guard and Navy set out to sea in hopes of finding the men. When investigating the gondola, what they discovered led to even more questions and nothing seemed to make sense and account for how the blimp even ended up crashing. One of the first things noticed was the fact that the gondola's door was open and the microphone attached to the loudspeaker was dangling outside of the doorway. Two of the three life jackets were also missing, but this wasn't something that stood out to those investigating, as pilots who were operating blimps above the sea were required to wear life jackets at all times in case of an emergency. Apart from those few things, nothing else in the gondola seemed out of place. A hat belonging to one of the men was found resting on the flight controls. The l radio was in perfect working order. The parachutes were still on board in their designated location. A briefcase containing classified documents was found next to the pilot seat. The l engines, ignition switches, instruments, and flight controls were all working as they should be. The blimp still had four hours of fuel remaining in the tanks, and those investigating went further in their search and discovered that there was a compartment that was standard on all L-type blimps, and that it would have easily taken on water if it were to come in contact with the ocean. 
When examining this particular compartment, it was completely dry and they even discovered dust inside of the compartment. So one thing that was certain was that that blimp never touched the water. The only things that would later be discovered that appeared strange was that the blimp's batteries were drained and part of its fuel supply had been dumped. The search for the pilots was simultaneously taking place. As the L-8 was being hauled away to a hangar for further examination, the Navy launched an intense search for Cody and Adams. Searching by both air and sea, for the next three days, both the Navy and Coast Guard searched the surrounding area, the flight path, and the Pacific, looking for the men. Yet, even though the seas were calm and visibility was good, no sign of either pilot was made. For the following weeks, the U.S. Navy was constantly being questioned by both the families and press for answers. The only problem was that there weren't really any to give. The lack of any credible lead, the timeline of events that made it seemingly impossible for the two men to vanish with no witnesses, and the perfect working order of the blimp made any speculation into the mystery hit a dead end. One question that was frequently asked was, well, the obvious. Was the L-8 attacked by a Japanese sub? The very thing the two pilots were searching for. When asked if this were possible, a Navy spokesperson responded saying that no fire, no submersion, no misconduct, and no missiles struck the L-8. During the investigation, over 35 witnesses were called in to recount their version of events, and even then, nothing that was documented could shed any light on what actually happened. Included in those 35 witnesses were also crew members from both the Daisy Gray and the Gallatin, and they all testified that when they saw the L-8, the pilots were both in the gondola. The engines were running, and they saw no sign of alarm. Nobody saw either pilot fall from the blimp, and no distress call was ever made. It seemed regardless of the fact that the incident had over two dozen witnesses, the blimp being recovered, and a massive search by both the Navy and Coast Guard, that this mystery was destined to stay in the state forever. But, like many mysteries, this one had no shortage of theories. The theories on this mystery, like many, falls into both the categories of plausible and others a bit more far-fetched. The facts that we know are that both Cody and Adams were experienced and sensible pilots. Cody was a senior aviator of an airship patrol squadron and a graduate of Annapolis. He was also said to not be a person to lose his head under pressure. Adams, likewise, was an experienced pilot, even more so than Cody having 20 years in LTA flights. He had even been at the Hindenburg disaster and actually rescued several passengers. So both pilots were experienced, and while Cody hadn't had as much experience when it came to LTA flights as Adams did, he was still fairly familiar by that point, as he had been piloting L-8s for around nine months. On top of both pilots being experienced, the L-8 itself was in great condition when it landed. As I stated earlier, the radio was working, the life raft was intact and still in the gondola, the engines and flight controls were all in perfect operating order, and even further, there were ships and other aircrafts in the area, with both pilots being physically seen and frequent sightings of the blimp itself being reported. The window for something happening would have to be very small, and given that the conditions were clear that day, it seems almost impossible that if the pilots had fallen out of the blimp, that nobody would have seen them at the time or during their search and rescue in the following days. One of the more popular theories on this mystery was that both Cody and Adams were actually captured by a Japanese submarine and that it happened shortly after investigating the oil spill. 
The timeline of the events on that day are vital to this. So at 6.03 a.m., the L-8 departed from Treasure Island and headed to the Farallon Islands. At 7.38 a.m. was when Cody radioed in reporting their position as four miles east of the Farallon Islands. At 7.42 a.m. was when the oil spill was reported. The L-8 would lower down and investigate the oil spill until shortly after 9 a.m. During the time of the investigation, Cody and Adams were seen by crew members of the Daisy Gray and of the Gallatin. Also, during this time, two attempts were made by radio command to the L-8, yet no responses were made. However, we know that at the time of both of those communication attempts, that both men were investigating the oil spill and had numerous witnesses physically seeing them in the gondola. Why they didn't respond to radio command is still a mystery, as the radio would later be reported to be in working order. After 9 a.m., the blimp ascended and presumably made its way back to the intended flight path. This is where some think that the Japanese submarine theory comes into play. Some speculate that it could be possible that Cody and Adams did in fact see a submarine, and the reason they left the area of the oil spill was to follow the sub and see where it was going. The next reported sighting of the blimp wouldn't be until 10.49 a.m., nearly two hours since leaving the oil spill. This obviously would be more than enough time to have something happen to the two men, yet many who believe this theory question if there could have been anyone else who saw the L-8 and simply didn't report its location. After all, why would they, if seeing blimps in the area was a common thing? Yet, this near two-hour window is where people believe that they were captured by a Japanese submarine. The issues I have with that are if they were in fact following a sub, then why didn't they report it to their base? They, up until that point, had been giving their location and their investigation into the oil spill, yet they suddenly decide to stop for apparently no reason at all, given that their radio was clearly working, and the other thing would be why even follow the submarine at all, when the blimp was equipped with two depth charges specifically attached to be used in the instance of seeing an enemy sub. The door to the gondola was left open, so that does lead me to believe it could have been due to a hasty exit from being taken prisoner, but to me, I suppose the biggest problem with this theory is that there was a briefcase of classified documents on board and they were not taken. I could imagine if the blimp was boarded, then surely these would have been taken. True, they could have simply been overlooked, but it just seems too obvious to ignore. And overall, I don't believe this is what actually happened. Another theory on the matter was that the reason for both men vanishing was accidental instead of malicious. The theory goes that when the pilots were investigating the oil slick, that due to the L-8 having small windows, Adams got up, opened the gondola door, and dropped the smoke tracers out to mark the location. Adams could have, during this, slipped and lost his footing and grabbed the side of the blimp in an attempt to catch himself. Yelling for Cody to help him, Cody leaves the controls and runs to help Adams. As he attempts to grab him, Cody himself loses his footing and both men slip and fall nearly 300 feet until hitting the ocean. At that height, it would have killed both men instantly, and caused them to sink as soon as they hit the water. Now true, this could have happened in a moment when nobody on board either of the boats were looking. Maybe they fell in a manner that they were concealed by the smoke from the tracer flares. But again, if that were the case, then why were their bodies never found? You have to remember that both pilots were wearing life jackets due to the regulation requiring them to do so, since they were above the water. It checks out that when the gondola was later searched, that two of the three life jackets were unaccounted for, so they had to be on the pilots. And if that is the case, then why didn't their bodies float back up? Unless the life jackets themselves burst upon impact with the water. It could explain why no radio communication was made by the pilots when command tried to contact them, and also could explain why the blimp suddenly ascended with no warning or broadcast made to the ships. But all of these factors seem to have to have happened in perfect order and timing for nobody to have seen. 
I would imagine at the very least that if Cody and Adams did fall into the water, being so close to other boats, then someone would have heard the splash. Other theories that I have found that have no evidence to back them up and appear to fall into the well it could have happened category include the two men being involved in the lover's triangle situation and it got hostile and one of the men killed the other. Literally, there is no proof of that ever occurring. That Cody and Adam were spies, yet they left the briefcase of classified documents. That a rogue wave reached 300 feet high and knocked the men out of the gondola. There were no reported sightings of rogue waves, and the gondola itself was reported to have never even touched water. Cody's mother-in-law apparently saw him five years later, but didn't report it to anybody. And the theory that makes it into every single mystery, aliens. Which, you know, maybe. Just maybe. What I feel happened falls in line somewhat with the second theory. I'm going to take a shot in the dark here and say that both Cody and Adams ended up in the ocean. I think it occurred after the oil spill investigation in the two hour window when no reported sighting was made. Shortly after the sighting reported at 10.49 a.m. was when everything seemed to happen with the blimp itself, moving in such an odd fashion and going in a vastly different direction than its intended flight path. I believe by the time it was seen at 10.49 a.m., Neither Cody or Adams were in the gondola, and the blimp itself was simply floating. It would explain its strange movements, with ascending near 2,000 feet and then ending up minutes later hitting the shores of Ocean Beach. The L-8 blimps did have a valve that automatically opened at 2,500 feet to prevent a fatal failure. Many attribute this as the cause of the blimp's rapid descent. One thing I discovered while researching this was that on the day of the flight, there was supposed to be a third person on the gondola. Aviation machinist Riley Hill was scheduled to be on board but was ordered off due to the weight he added to the blimp. There was heavy moisture on the envelope that was weighing the blimp down, making it unsafe. Riley later stated that he had left the door on the gondola unsecured and assumed Cody or Adams would lock it behind him. Knowing this, I feel that during the flight, Adams could have been leaning on or near the gondola door, and since it wasn't secure, he fell out, leaving Cody, the less experienced, to run to the door instead of reporting to radio command. And when trying to either save him or see where he fell, accidentally fell out of the L-8 as well. Now true, both were wearing their life jackets, but they could have been damaged if they fell from a great enough height. If that were the case though, then I wonder how their bodies, or literally any sign of them, were never discovered. It wasn't like the search attempt waited weeks before looking for these pilots. It happened literally hours later. But even my own theory into the matter of this mystery has holes. If they did fall overboard, why were their bodies never recovered? Why didn't they report back to Radio Command when investigating the oil spill? Why would someone as experienced as Adams even risk leaning on the gondola's door? Ultimately, I do not know if this mystery will ever be solved. But I do feel that both Adams and Cody ended up in the ocean. How that occurred, we may never know. But what is known is that on August 16th, 1942, two pilots boarded a blimp with the intention of finding enemy submarines and protecting their country, but instead ended up falling into a mystery that would go on to remain unsolved to this day, nearly eight decades later. <laughs>